Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If this is your first time here or you've been sitting in the back row, please consider hitting that subscribe button and set your bell notification to all. That way it'll remind you of every time I upload a video. Plus, it also helps the channel. Also, if you enjoy what you're hearing, you could buy me a coffee. Or if you want to learn how to become a member of the channel, all of that information can be found down below. Now, with all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Backwoods Creepy Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. This is not my story, but a close friend's. They were camping as a family, mom, dad, two small girls, in Washington State. They hiked up the mountains for like 10 miles before setting up camp. Everything was great until about an hour after dark. They heard someone coming up the trail. No lights, just walking steps. The footsteps stopped outside their tent. My friend's spouse unzipped the tent to see who it was. There was a nearly naked man with wild hair and a huge beard standing right outside, staring back at him. Zip in the stats is the only thing he said to them when they ask him anything. My friend starts freaking out. Why is a nearly naked man trying to get them to zip stats? What stats exactly? How does one zip a stat? It was too far of a hike back to the car in the dark, so they zipped up the tent and basically stayed awake all night while the man sat near their fire pit. At first light, they repacked and hiked back to the car. The man followed them most of the way. They didn't see him do any drugs, and he had nowhere to keep his stash since he only had on a fancy loincloth. About halfway to the car, he disappeared behind them on the trail. They hoped they could put the incident in the past and forget about it, and they almost could until they got to their car and saw someone had written in car soap or chalk, zip in the stat on every single window of their car. I grew up in Vietnam. My family is very affluent, so we had just 10 acres of land all to ourselves. No one else really lived here except a house here and there. Our closest neighbors were three miles away. Our territory wasn't good except for a smallish brick wall, and we had a ton of street dogs that we adopted that kind of roamed around. I was under strict instructions to never go anywhere past these certain trees that were marked, and once the sunset started, I couldn't go past the West Territory. Now, I want to say that in Vietnam, people are very superstitious. It is not so much whether you believe in ghosts, spirits, the paranormal, or whatever, but whether they can harm you. Whenever I walked past those trees, the dogs would furiously bark, and a few would drag me back by my shirt, or even go bark at my family's workers and kind of tell on me. I always assumed that it was because I was very young, so they didn't want me to wander off and get lost. When I was 13, I became more and more interested. My family went to a funeral while the workers still worked, and my grandmother watched me. My grandmother was a very old woman, and I was a very sneaky child. I obviously snuck off, and while I was wandering through the woods, I was just exploring. I saw pythons, lizards, water monitors, and monkeys. Here's the weird thing. I felt like the whole time these animals were kind of leading me to something, if that makes sense. 
I distinctly remember the first animal that I saw was a huge dragonfly. It led me past the marked trees on the east side of my territory, and then I saw frogs that had nearly weird textures to them, very rough and kind of lizard-like. I felt like I was in a trance-like state, an animal transformed into another animal, and I began to come to the realization that these weren't different animals, but the same ones that were transforming. I didn't see it transform, but it could be a monitor lizard, and then it would go past a rock, and the next animal would be a huge python. I should also mention that all of my dogs, we had about 20 of them at that time, were fiercely protective of me and trailed me in the shadows. All the workers always said that wherever I walked, a horde of dogs would follow and when I slept at night, they all slept directly outside my window. However, less and less dogs followed me as I got deeper into the woods. By the time I saw the lizard monitor, I'm pretty sure only a handful were still with me. Most stayed back after the first few trees. I realized it was getting really dark, but the sky looked weird for some reason. I stopped following the animal, which was a monkey at this point, and just turned back. Getting back was a lot more difficult than getting there. When I was following the creature, I feel like the woods were just kind of opening up a trail for me. Like, I didn't trip on any shrubs or vines, and nothing really blocked my way. The way going back, I was convinced the woods completely changed. I wasn't really scared, just a little cold, since I believed I didn't even wander off that far. Eventually, I heard some dogs barking and followed, and I could see my house. Everyone was frantic when I came back. They had about a hundred people searching for me, family and our workers, and a few more people like extended family of workers that owed favors to my family. Apparently, I had been missing for three days, and the husband of one of the aunt's workers went in after me, and he's been missing since then. I got really scared and told my family what happened, and they went white in the face. We drove to a very popular Buddhist temple, and we got blessed, and the monks told my family what they believed happened while I stood outside eavesdropping with my older cousin. Our family has a problem with people going missing. My grandmother's brother said he felt like he was being guided with a hand on his back, and he was stuck between two rocks. His old black dog found him, which is a common belief in Vietnam that all black dogs are very powerful and can scare spirits away, which explains why my uncle always picked all black dogs. My grandma's first son, was playing in a creek while she traveled a little more downstream to do some laundry. And she said it seemed like someone pushed him in and held his head down as she tried to run to him. Something in the water wrapped around her foot. A villager nearby ran down to save them. The monks gave me a Buddha necklace in which they blessed, and I still wear that necklace today. The man that went missing who was looking for me was never found, although my mom told me they did. I believe my aunt paid the wife a large sum of money and bought them a house far away and still sends money regularly. A few days after this, the workers started chopping down trees and a fence was built around the east side of our territory, and we started a karaoke bar that now resides there. What do I believe happened? I have many theories, but I think the spirits were upset that my grandmother came into their land and built over it. Before my family cut down trees and built our house there, no one lived there. I think they were upset we were disturbing their peace and quiet. I still don't like going hiking to this day. When I do, it's never a very far hike, and I don't let my dog off leash because I end up terrified.
Last weekend, my friend and I went hiking in the Catskills. It's near Sundown Forest, by the way. And found this really creepy statue while fucking around in some caves. It has nails in its eyes and a noose around its neck. Looks like it might be old. I don't think it's been there very long, but it's weird because this cave was way off the trail. Someone had a fire in there not too long ago. The statue really wigged me out, but my buddy decided to take it home with him, even though I told him not to. Everyone says that there's devil worshippers that come out here to sacrifice animals and do their spells and shit like that, so I didn't want anything to do with this thing. A couple days later, my friend calls me and tells me that he thinks the statue is haunted because it keeps moving from its spot and he keeps smelling weird stuff. Says he can't sleep at night because banging keeps him up. Now, last night, someone knocked on his door, and no one was there when he opened it, and he's super weirded out. He thinks he has a ghost because of the statue. It must just be a coincidence, but I think he's actually scared. Before we go set this thing on fire, I wanted to see if anyone knows what it is. Anyone ever seen something like this or heard of a statue causing ghosts? couple of things I forgot in the story. My friend showed up at like 11.30. He's out of his mind scared. Never seen him like this before. I'm going to do my best to remember everything he just told me because it was a lot. But long story short, he's sleeping over because something is in his house. We found the statue on Sunday and like I said, I told him not to take it because it gave me bad vibes, but he took it anyway. He's been an atheist as long as I've known him, so when he told me that something was going on, I thought he was just fucking with me because I know I like to watch paranormal shows. He always made fun of me for that. It started out just as knocks and banging, but he said that by Wednesday, it started waking him in the middle of the night feeling like someone was watching him. This kept happening through the week, and every time he'd wake up, he would smell a really strong scent, like pond water. He doesn't believe in any of this stuff, so he just ignored it. Until a few days ago, when the statue moved from the desk in his living room. He said that very night, since Thursday, it's moved into a different room than where he had left it. He thought it was his dog moving it around, but it smelled funny, but his dog won't go anywhere near it. He says that she's actually peed in the house three nights in a row, and she's never done that before. Last night, someone knocked on his door at three in the morning, but when he went to open it, there was no one there. His motion lights weren't on, and there weren't any cars in his driveway. He said that he opened up the door to look outside, and that's when he knew that he made a big mistake, like he just felt like he shouldn't have opened this door. That's why I made this post in the first place. At that point, I didn't have any reason not to believe him because it had gone way beyond a joke, and he actually sounded really, really fucking scared on the phone. He kept telling me that he was going to burn the statue because he knows that something followed him home. Anyway, he stayed up all night and then decided to go to the movies to take his mind off of things. When he got home, he said he felt like everything was fine and he decided to finally go to bed. This is where it gets super fucked up. He says that when he woke up, which wasn't until like 10, it was because his dog was barking like crazy. He said the pond water smell was stronger than ever, and when he went out into his hallway, he saw all of these muddy footprints everywhere. Not like shoe prints, but bare feet prints. All of his doors and windows were locked. After someone knocked on his door, he freaked out and made sure everything was locked up. So there's no fucking way anyone could have gotten inside. Sitting in the living room was the fucking statue, which had moved yet again. 
and he says that when he started to go near it, he heard someone breathing, like his grandpa with his tracheotomy. He peaced the fuck out, and now he and his dog are sleeping in my guest room tonight. I've never seen him this scared, and he even started crying. I have no fucking idea what to do. I believe him because he has no reason to lie to me about this, because it's way far, way too far to have been a joke by now. I know that everyone says not to burn it or whatever, so what the fuck do we do? He wants me to go to his house and get the statue tomorrow, but I'm too fucking freaked out to take it back to wherever we found it, because I don't want to see whoever put it there. It was the summer of 2005. A friend of mine, Wayne, and I decided to spend the day fishing at Upper Swagger Lake in the Lost River Mountain Range of Idaho. Visited mostly by the locals, this alpine lake is tucked up on a ridge overseeing two long dry canyons on opposite sides. It sits just at the top of the tree line, providing an uninhibited view of the mountain and surrounding mountain peaks. The fishing is usually pretty good, if you like that golden trout. I hate trout. They taste like mud, but I do love fishing, and some of the best, most secluded lake fishing can be found on these high Idaho lakes. Getting to Swagger Lake is not an easy task, it's a 100-mile journey over a long highway from the region's largest town, Idaho Falls. When you hit the dirt road turnoff, there are miles of four-wheel driving up the canyon to the hiking trail. Once at the trailhead, it's a two-mile, 1,000-foot vertical gain hike up to the lake. But when you finally arrived, surrounded by the bald peaks, of the Little Lost Range. It's all worth the effort. Arriving at the lake around noon, we spent the day fishing, relaxing, and chatting. Far down in the canyon, out of sight from us, we continually heard periodic loud blasts. Growing up in the rural U.S., you get accustomed to people target shooting on public land, and that's what we concluded was happening below us. From the sheer thunderness, we guessed it was a large caliber, muzzle-loading rifle. The blasts were spaced out long enough that they had to be manually reloading their guns. The guns reverberated and echoed throughout the canyon. Whoever was down there was having a bit of fun with their rifle. Unperturbed by the cacophony down in the canyon, we continued fishing only momentarily reminded of the explosions as they continued to occur throughout the day. The fishing was great, and the day seemed to flash by. Before we knew it, the sun was cresting on the mountains. We headed back to camp for the night. Wayne had caught his limit towards the end of the day, while I had been releasing mine. We settled down to a campfire and watched the sun sink behind the mountain peaks as Wayne cooked his muddy fish. It was a twilight now. Aside from the crackling of the fire, it was a quiet evening. The sky was absolutely clear, and we watched as the stars twinkled into existence in the sky. Our relaxation was interrupted by yet another one of those thunderous explosions. Only this time, it sounded much closer to us that was really weird. Target shooting is extremely dangerous at night. Whoever was down there in the canyon was being very irresponsible. Wayne nudged me with his elbow and motioned for me to look in the direction of the sound of the last explosion. While not directly visible to us, there was a light down the mountain. It was illuminating the entire canyon. From the angles of the tree shadows, we could see the source of the light, which was not at ground level. It was up in the air, and it was moving. We watched in bewilderment, silence as the light moved up the canyon. 
we still could not get a direct line of sight on it. There was another blast that seemed to shake my skull. The light in the canyon flashed almost a hundred times brighter than before. We could absolutely not make sense of what was happening. As we sat there, unsure of what to do, the light rose upwards out of the canyon. As it created the trees and continued to rise, we could finally get a direct look. It was a brilliant ball of yellow golden light. Getting a size estimate was difficult, but I figured it was between 20 to 40 feet in diameter. The light rose silently above the canyon and then above our elevation at the lake. It stopped several hundred feet above the surrounding landscape and stayed there. The object's surface shimmered and danced. Little feathers of sparks would periodically jump away from the object and fall down toward the tree line. Wayne looked at me, and all I could do was shrug my shoulders and give him a, I have no damn idea, look. After a few minutes, the ball's surface stopped dancing. It was completely still in the air above us. No sound, no movement. With no warning, it exploded in a deafening shower of sparks and blinding light. Wayne and I instinctively jumped into the dirt and covered our heads. The light was so bright I felt I could see through my closed eyelids. The explosion shook everything around us. I could feel the shock resonate in the ground beneath me. It was like the world was coming undone at the seams. Then, everything was absolutely silent and dark. The whole event could only have been a handful of seconds long, but it felt like hours. When we looked up into the sky, the ball of light was gone. We were left alone in just the dim light of the stars. Picking myself up out of the dirt, all I could say to Wayne was, What in the hell was that about? He chuckled nervously, but didn't reply. We surveyed the camp and the surrounding area. Nothing seemed damaged or disturbed. There were no signs of fires that were started from the explosion. It was like nothing out of the ordinary had happened. The only thing that was off, though, was the time. It was late twilight when the light exploded before us. But my watch was showing two o'clock in the morning. Further baffling us was Wayne's fish. They were now charred cinders above a bed of red coals that were once our campfire. I'm well aware of the phenomenon of missing time, but that was not possible. The stupid thing exploded. We hit the dirt. And then we picked ourselves up. Couldn't have been more than a couple of minutes from the explosion to us getting up. I didn't have the mental capacity to process what had happened. I headed to my tent and went right to sleep. It was a deep, dreamless sleep. When I awoke, the morning sun was illuminating the tent. Wayne was already up and fishing. I asked him about his thoughts on what had happened last night, and he simply shrugged and said, It either didn't happen or we saw something we probably shouldn't have. It's that or Marvin the Martian trying to kill us. We fished for a few more hours that morning, then decided against camping another night at the lake. We packed up camp and hiked down to our vehicle. This happened almost 20 years ago, and I've been back to Swagger Lake several times over the years. I've never seen or heard anything like what we saw that night ever again. I don't have an explanation for what happened, and don't believe we ever will. I grew up in a densely forested rural area in central Virginia, and like most kids my age, 10 at the time of this story, I spent a lot of time playing in and around the woods. 
My best friend and I had found a creek one day while exploring different deer tracks throughout the woods. This creek we happened upon was a very rare find and the perfect spot for us to play. It was wide and deep enough to swim around in and had nice soft mossy banks on either side to rest on after we had tired ourselves out. The water was cool and clear, no copperheads and no mosquitoes because the water was constantly running. We were psyched and after a few hours of swimming, we had to walk back home for lunch, but made plans to pack lunch the next day so we could have a picnic right here at the creek's banks and spend the whole day there. The next morning, we set out for the woods at around 1 p.m., planning to have the picnic first and swim after. We entered at the same spot we had the previous day and followed what we thought was the same deer trail. It was not. At the point where we should have found the creek, we walked into a small clearing that was covered in huge, thick ferns. We had definitely never walked past this before. So, being both hungry and tired of walking, we decided to eat in the clearing. We laughed and played around there for a while, spitting watermelon seeds at each other from our lunch. It was an absolute blast, and we were both in wonderful giddy moods. That all changed, however, as soon as we packed up and set back out to find the creek. As we walked on through the woods, we started to feel it getting darker and colder. We got skittish, and I noticed that my friend kept whipping her head around to look behind us. After about a half hour of walking, we come up on what looks like an entire overgrown bathroom, sink, toilet, and bathtub, all sitting arranged together and covered in ivy. It's pretty common to find weird shit like this in the middle of the woods, so we just walked on and made jokes to lighten the mood, calling it Bigfoot's bathroom. After another hour of walking and not seeing anything we recognized, we started to panic. Instead of trying to reach the creek, we were now just trying to find our way back home, or out of the woods, at least. I told her we should follow the sign, and eventually we would come up on a road or someone's property where we could hopefully find some help. She insisted on another way, and we began yelling at each other out of fear, and, let's be honest, little girl bossing us. I told her that if she thought she was so right, she should go her way and we would see who got out first. So we split up. Now, as an adult, I fully acknowledge I was being a stubborn brat and also a complete idiot. Worst possible thing we could have done. Not 10 minutes after splitting up, I began to hear someone walking maybe 100 feet behind me. Thinking it was my friend deciding to go my way after all, I slowed down so she could catch up to me. Instead, whatever it was matched my pace. I slow down. It slows down. I stop. It stops. This went on for hours. The whole time I was going back and forth on whether or not it was in my head or there really was someone following me. I pick up a big stick, swung it a few times to make sure it was sturdy, if I had to hit someone, and trucked it. As it began to get dark, I came up on something that made my heart sink into my stomach. It was Bigfoot's bathroom. I had just walked in a huge circle for hours, despite being 100% sure I was following the setting sun west the entire time. Confused and frustrated, I sat down on a log and just screamed my little heart out while smacking my whoop-ass stick repeatedly into the ground. As I tried to collect myself, I heard the footsteps again walking up on me from behind. I called out my friend's name as loud as I could. No answer. Then, after a short pause, the steps began to run towards me. I jumped up and booked it as fast as I could in the opposite direction. Now, 
This is the truly horrifying part, which I typically omit while telling people this story. As I was sprinting through the darkening woods, I began to hear what I thought were church bells. I looked up to see the darkest, deepest cloud I have ever seen in my life. In the middle, it was so black, it was like looking into the night sky, and the dark gray around it seemed to be swirling. It gave me a horrible feeling to look at, almost like the nausea you get when looking through binoculars too long. What sickened me further is that I realized the sound of the bells were coming through the hole in the cloud. They were definitely loud. I mean, really booming out of this thing. When I realized this, I stopped dead in my tracks. I felt a sense of absolute and overwhelming dread that has gone unmatched in all of my 24 years on this planet. Something in my head began screaming that if I did not run away from whatever the hell that cloud was, no one would ever see me again. I would be gone. I did not want to run towards the thing chasing me either, so I made a sharp right and took off away from both. It was now completely dark and I was running blind through the woods, smacking through branches, wheezing, and tripping every few feet for what seemed like another hour, until I smacked into something low and flew over it, hitting the ground so hard all of the air in my lungs was knocked out of me. As I lay there trying to recover, I realized I couldn't hear the bells anymore. Then my eyes adjusted more to the dark, and I realized what had just made me go ass over teeth was an old fence. Grabbing hold of it, I prayed it would lead me to a farm, and sure enough, it did. I walked up over a hill about a mile to the back of the farmhouse, explained what had happened, and the farmer graciously gave me a ride back home. I was covered head to toe in scrapes, oozing blood, and more exhausted than I had ever been in my life, but I was finally safe. It was past 9 p.m. when I finally walked through my front door. My friend had gotten back shortly after we split and figured I had as well, so I hadn't told anybody I was lost, and my family just figured I was still out after dark, which wasn't uncommon for me. They were shocked when I walked in, beat up and crying. Nobody had been looking for me at all. To this day, I wonder how long they would have waited to come find me if I hadn't been lucky enough to find the fence, and if it would have been too late. This is a series of weird and creepy events that have happened to me and my mate across the past week and a half and all come to a head last night. It's a pretty long story and it has a lot of detail but I'll try to recall what happened as best as possible. Bear with me because it gets pretty creepy. So I'll preface the story with the fact that I'm traditionally not a very spiritual person. I have always been quite cynical of paranormal activity. And even though I know that there may be some things beyond our understanding, I've always believed that there's usually a very logical scientific reason for most paranormal occurrences. Everyone in my friendship group also shares the same view until what happened the other night. So, my mates, my boyfriend, and I lived on a uni residence, which is surrounded by a dense Australian forest. I have been there for over a year now and have enjoyed going on multiple bushwalks both during the day and at night. I've grown up surrounded by bush. My high school was on 200 acres of bush, and I live on a country property in the middle of nowhere. At this point, the land and the forest have become my safe space, 
I have been in the uni forest plenty of times to take a breather from uni stress, and I have never noticed anything sinister in there. Over the past few weeks, my boyfriend and his mates have been building a pretty impressive fort in the bush. They have spent every free minute taking an axe to old dead logs and building this fort, which is about the size of a caravan. Understandably, they're pretty proud of this creation, so last night they decided to show some third years what they have been working on. As they were walking towards the fort, these third years stopped and told us they didn't want to go any further. They told us that they had had some bad experiences in that section of the forest, and they told us they were too scared to venture in. It was also about midnight at this point, so it was very dark. I thought these third years were merely pranking us, so I began joking and making light of the situation. To my surprise, though, my boyfriend, Matt, and my friend, Darcy, are very accommodating of the third year's fear and told them they'd be happy to accompany them out of the bush. They oddly seemed kind of freaked out themselves. I then remembered that Matt had actually told me before that the bush could be quite scary at night, which actually amused me because usually he's the type of annoying macho man who believes that fear is a sign of weakness. One of the third years, Nick, wanted to press on, but the other two, Kyle and Adam, wanted to head back. I had seen the fort for a few times, so I volunteered to go back with Kyle and Adam. As we were leaving the forest, I asked Kyle and Adam what made them so scared of the forest in general. They told me they didn't want to talk about it when we were in there, but they did point out to me that the section of the forest we were in was unnaturally still and quiet. As a cynical person, I had to admit that it was a bit odd that only that section we were in was dead still, whereas about 20 meters away across the road, the trees were blowing madly in the wind. Once we had left the forest, Kyle and Adam's demeanor changed significantly, and they finally felt comfortable expressing to me what they had experienced in the bush before. Very long story short, Across the three years that they had lived on campus, they, and a few other people, had had multiple encounters with what seemed to be old-looking spirits in the shape of a man in a hunched-over position. The spirit was always accompanied by the bush going unnaturally silent and an overwhelming feeling of impending evil and doom. He said that the reason the forest goes so still and quiet is because something inside of it is listening to you and hunting you. Kyle, being the man of indigenous culture, told me that at one point, the spirit was so close to one of his friends that he had to call an aboriginal elder to run a smoking ceremony. This elder told Kyle that the presence of evil was overwhelming in the forest, and she warned him never to go in too deep again. Kyle also begun educating me about aboriginal legends and expressing his fear of the noises, like screams and whistles, distinctly human screams and whistles, not foxes or birds, and the feelings he had experienced in the bush. At this point, I am listening ardently, but was also viewing these stories as purely fictitious, as opposed to something to be concerned about. Even though I didn't really believe in the stories, I was interested in learning more about the aboriginal culture, and I was honored that Kyle was opening up to me about something which seemed to be very personal and significant to only him. About half an hour later, Matt, Darcy, and Nick emerged from the forest and headed back over to us. As they approached, I could tell that they seemed pretty obviously shaken by something. And for the first time that night, definitely not the last, I suddenly felt very anxious. Matt and Darcy explained that they were showing Nick the fort when they 
all suddenly felt an overwhelming feeling of dread and that all unanimously decided that they needed to leave. Matt also admitted to momentarily catching a glimpse of what he said looked hunched over like that man in front of the trees near the fort. He said he would have thought it was a shadow had he not seen the man's eyes reflect the light off of his phone torch. At this point, my belief that they were pranking us diminished entirely as Kyle was visibly freaking out and Matt looked shaken. I could tell they weren't acting, and I also didn't believe Kyle would exploit his own culture for the sake of a cheap joke. We all now headed back to our respective dorms as we figured we'd better get as far from this forest as possible. I felt much better to be inside, only until Matt turned to me and suddenly said, I need to go back and talk to Kyle. When I looked into his eyes, I could tell something was very wrong, and my anxiety amped up significantly. Him behaving this way was very, very unusual, and something was clearly bothering him. So we headed over to Kyle's unit and knocked on the door to his room. Matt explained to both of us that two days prior, he had come across a massive tree in a clearing that was covered in some odd sort of bulbs. Him being an absolute moron decided it would be a clever idea to take an axe to the bulbs to see what they were made of. He admitted that the reason he was asking Kyle about it was because he couldn't shake the memory or thought of this tree and it was becoming unbearable and stressful. Kyle was obviously furious about this. As it turned out, that was the tree Matt had damaged and was very sacred and ancient, and Kyle believed that Matt might have agreed to the forest and the spirits within it. He asked Matt if he had experience in incidents over the past few days, and Matt, matter-of-factly, told us that the gash on his face caused by a falling branch that missed his eye by mere centimeters actually happened about 20 minutes after he axed the tree. He also told Kyle he had lied when he initially told us he'd seen the hunched man for the first time tonight. He had in fact seen him three times over the course of the past week and twice in the past two days. He also told us that the reason he left the forest that night of axing the tree, besides the fact he had a bleeding cut on his face, was because all of the boys working on the fort had suddenly heard a very, very unnatural sound in the forest. Something between a human scream and a whistle. They said they would have thought it was an animal had everything else not suddenly gone completely silent. When they heard the noise again, closer this time, they grabbed their stuff and legged it. It was almost at this point when I realized that over the past two days, and I could literally pin it to wherever Matt was around, I had felt extremely agitated and sad. It was a pretty intense feeling, and I felt really guilty because it was nothing Matt was doing to upset me that was causing my distress. It was as simple as it being his energy or vibe that was bothering me. I love this man. We have never had any arguments. But the night after the axed tree, which he didn't tell me about, and which I don't condone, by the way, I remember feeling such a distinct feeling of discomfort wherever he was around me. It got so bad at one point that I locked myself in my room and cried all night about it. I was confused and sad that the person I loved was making me this distressed when he had seemingly done nothing wrong. I pinned it on my period, except that is not due for another week, and usually doesn't cause such emotional deregulation. I'm still not necessarily saying that the tree and Matt's energy were linked, but it was a feeling that was so weird to me and so unexplainable to begin with. 
so this almost made sense to me. Kyle now told Matt that he and I and everyone else involved in making the fort needed to get saged as quickly as possible to ward off any evil spirits around him. Matt, despite his initial disbelief, agreed immediately. We met with another Aboriginal student, Ash, and their partner, Key, and they provided the sage. Before the ceremony, Key told us that they were going to go gauge the vibes, and Ash told us that Key had an innate ability to fill spirits in the wind. The second that Key walked out of the unit, I swear to God that the wind did one of the weirdest things I have ever experienced. It was the biggest gust of wind so far, and it carried the faintest howl of about five different notes and octaves. It came from, well, beyond the tree line, like a wave and flew unnaturally quickly in our direction. It flew through me as if collecting my shadow, and it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. It didn't feel sinister, though, and Key reassured us that it was a normal phenomenon and that they experience it whenever in touch with the spirits. What wasn't normal, though, was the smell that permeated in the air about 30 meters from the tree line. It was almost artificial and like nothing I'd smelt before, and it clearly scared Key as they began to tell us that something was very, very wrong. Key told us that something was stalking us from just beyond the tree line and that it was very, very angry. Apparently, we needed to begin to sage now or else it would follow us into the residence. As we walked to the glow of the nearby lamppost, Key told us that it was too late and that the evil thing was already following us. And that was when the brand new, relatively expensive, lighter we had recently bought broke. It just completely broke. We tried to light the sage, and the button fell off, and the thing cracked open. We now needed a new lighter, and Key told us that the thing was getting closer and closer. Whether it was related or not, I could not stop shaking despite being warm under a lot of layers of clothing. As a pack, we headed to a room to get a new lighter and Ash advised us that Matt should stand away as we tried to light the sage. After a couple of attempts where the fire bent around the sage, and I mean literally, was repelled by the stick, Matt stood far enough away, and finally it lit. Once we all were fully sage, we were all feeling significantly better and were ready to sleep. It was probably 2.30 in the morning at this point. I got back to Matt's room, now completely comfortable around him for the first time in two days, and we got into bed. The other two people in our room were already asleep and sleeping soundly. Matt and I talked for a while about random stuff, nothing ghostly, and I ended up feeling very comfortable and happy as we eventually stopped talking and he drifted off. As a bit of an insomniac, it takes me a while to doze off, so usually I just sit on my phone until I feel sleepy. That was when it happened. It happened with a very faint tap that I paid not much mind to, but in hindsight, didn't have a known source. Then the dogs from the suburb across from uni went nuts. It was a very faint sound, but they were disturbed nonetheless. Nothing made me think that it was anything paranormal until multiple things happened at once. The room went very still and silent, as if a ward of cotton had replaced the air. The heater stopped, and faint noises of breathing stopped. Even Matt next to me was silent. And then my legs went icy, icy cold, unnaturally cold. The rest of my body was warm, but legs were freezing. Then my whole body just as suddenly became uncomfortably hot. Initially, I was worried I was having a stroke or a heart attack or something. Finally, an all-consuming, overwhelming, intense feeling of evil 
permeated everything. It was evil and angry and like nothing I had ever felt before. I couldn't link it to a specific spot in the room, but I knew it was strongest near Matt. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't speak. I knew it wasn't sleep paralysis because I had been on my phone the entire time and was not remotely asleep. I could also move freely and I didn't feel paralyzed. I sat bolted upright and felt a panic attack coming on. I'm usually not one to cry very easily and I'm never one to have a panic attack, but this rendered me to both. I was sitting upright and praying with everything I could think of for this to go away. I was shaking and crying. I didn't want to wake the others to ask them if they could feel it because I knew that would anger it. I didn't end up needing to wake them though because Matt awoke suddenly with a start. It scared the life out of me because his voice cut the silence, but he was just asking if I was okay. I was not okay. The thing was now feeling even more evil than ever. I couldn't speak. I just sat there more terrified than I have ever been in my life. Matt then went dead still and said to me, You feel that, right? I couldn't even nod. I was praying with everything I could muster. I'm not even religious, but I was calling on all the little things I knew about religion. God, Jesus, angels, etc. I was repeating in my mind that I meant the thing no harm and that I'm sorry if I offended it. All I remember saying aloud is, Something is very, very bad. And Matt just nodded, looking terrified. Eventually, after what felt like a lifetime of prayers, the feeling began diminishing and everything slowly felt calm again. The noise returned, the breathing of the others in the dorm, the heater cranked on, the wind outside resumed. Whatever it was seemed to have left. Once I felt safe enough to lie down, Matt and I snuggled up together and tried our best to fall asleep. I was worried that the thing would return when Matt fell asleep in order to attack him when he was at his most vulnerable. But it didn't, thank God. My sleep was ridden with nightmares about spirits and I would wake up unusually early. In the morning, though, I seemed to feel okay. Matt and I talked and he reckons we both were freaked out off the back of a really creepy night. What's weird, though, is that before the encounter, or whatever it was, I was not even remotely scared. To be honest, when I went to bed that night, I was still pretty skeptical that there was even a spirit to begin with. Not that morning, though. I'm still convinced that it was a spirit in that room that night. I have never, ever felt anything like the fear I felt in that situation. I watched horror movies. I've intentionally freaked myself out in creepy places before, and only that night did I feel any sort of presence. I can't entirely describe it. I asked Kyle, Ash, and Key that morning if we should be concerned about its visiting our room, and they told us that if whatever it was wanted to hurt us, it would have done so by now. They said they believe it was more of a warning for us to leave it alone, more of a threat than an act of violence. We also then discovered, as Darcy went back into the bush that day, Matt and I declined the invite, that their well-structured, carefully constructed fort that could carry the weight of all of them had collapsed in the night. It wasn't a stormy night. It wasn't any more windy than any other night had been. The fort had entirely caved in on itself, as if having been trampled by a large creature. Rather these things are coincidental or not, I'm not sure, but it sure freaked me the hell out. I haven't had any odd experiences since, but I also haven't gone back into the forest since. 
I still don't know whether or not I want to. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true, backwood, creepy stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elliott, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Colt Stonewolf, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's Niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for supporting Back to Ashes. Not only does it help me and the channel, but it also helps you as well. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night. Peace love and light to you all.